Welcome back to the making of the Watt Micrometer. What drew me to this piece is not just its place in the history of measurement, but also the innovative use of the screw, particularly the lead screw. There's also a worm gear and of course the screws that hold everything together. For a simple device, there's a lot going on here. Today I'll be making those screws utilizing a number of different techniques. Each of those three kinds, the worm gear, lead screw, and the machine screws holding everything together, are made in very different ways. Let's get to work. The worm is made of brass. I'll start by center drilling, and then drilling slightly under the final size. And I'm turning two diameters. One is where the hand will be attached, which will be machined square later, and the other is the necessary diameter where the teeth will be. That's a critical diameter. Let me show you how I'm calculating it. I want 20 teeth on this worm gear. The cutter is 20 teeth per inch, which is 50 thousandths per tooth. So the 20 teeth I want at 50 thousandths per tooth is one inch. But we're actually going to machine the diameter. So we simply divide the circumference by pi and we get 0 0.318 and a half thousandths. Once the correct diameters are turned, I'm parting off and turning the piece around, and then I'll ream the hole to exactly one eighth of an inch. I'll put a little chamfer on the end by running the lathe backwards and quickly cutting the backside. Now I've made a little tool for the worm gear to spin freely on. It's just a piece of mild steel which has a 1 h piece of steel rod pressed into it. I'm using a little 1000 grit sandpaper on it until the workpiece would spin freely but not really have any play. That's all mounted in a tool holder and brought to the lathe. Setting the correct height required a little thinking. I ended up putting a rod of a known dimension into the lathe and adding half of the rod's diameter to my desired offset from centerline. Then using my micrometers, I used the depth end to set the right height. Probably not perfect, but it's accurate enough for what I need. Now here's the trick. To cut this, I'm using a 3 8 inch, 20 tooth per inch tap as the hob. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. 3 8 inch, 20, that's not very standard. It's not. It's a specialty item, but they're out there. 20 teeth per inch is useful because it divides into one inch so nicely. And 3 8 is better than the very standard quarter 20 because it gives us more strength over the distance we need. I'm sticking the tap directly into the chuck. With the speed low, I'm plunging the workpiece directly into the tap. Now you'll understand why the diameter is so critical. Because the tap will rotate the workpiece around, and we need to get the right dimension so the teeth will line up. But that same diameter is a problem later. While necessary to get the teeth to line up for later operations, like cutting the end square to hold the dial hand, we're going to need to put it into a collet, and it's currently a little too big for my closest collet. Now that the teeth are done, we can take a few thousandths off and get it down to a nice even 5 sixteenths. And that's where we're going to leave the worm gear for now. To make the lead screw, I'm starting with 3 8 inch mild steel and center drilling the end. Then, after pulling it out to length, I'm bringing the tailstock in to support it. Now, it's not shown in the following clips, but I'm relying heavily on a travadile on my carriage to help with the measuring. Someday I'll get that DRO. First, I'm going to turn one end down, where it will pass through the support block in the micrometer and eventually have the dial hand attached to it. Again, I'm using the travadile to measure how far I want to cut, and then making a small score to mark it.
quick word about the cutter I'm using. This looks like a carbide insert, but it's really high speed steel. While these are not well known, I think they're great in the home machining environment. To use carbide inserts properly, you need really high RPMs and deep cuts, which most home lathes are not well equipped to do. The high speed steel insert is, in my opinion, the best of most worlds. I'll talk a little more about these in a future episode. This insert came with a 15 thousandths nose radius, but before putting it into the holder, I rubbed it against a sharpening stone until almost all of that radius was gone. This will give the thread a little more accurate minor diameter. Finally, I'll do a couple spring passes for cleanup. A couple light strokes of the file, and we're looking good. To finish the screw, I need to part off the waste stock on the other end. If I put the screw into a regular three or four jaw chuck, I'd run the risk of messing up the threads. So instead, I'm switching to a Jacobs Rubber Flex Collet Chuck. You don't see this around too much anymore, but I find them really handy for a lot of situations. The collets are rubber with metal that runs the length of them and can expand or be compressed to accommodate a fairly broad range for a collet. When you have an odd size or something delicate, the flex collets are a great choice. All that's left to do is part off and we've got a good looking part. What seems like the simplest item to make, the machine screws that hold everything together, is actually going to be our most involved part. I'm going to machine some tooling that will allow us to get a good finish. First, I'm taking a scrap piece of cutoff stock and cleaning it up in the lathe. Then we're going to mount on the lathe on a V-block with a small piece of scrap to make up the difference with the V-block. I'm going to find the center of the part and then start milling down until I get the desired flat I'm after. Then, on either side of the flats, I'm going to machine some steps. You'll see why in a moment. With the steps done, they fit well in a tool holder. Now with the part vertical, and again held in with a V-block and a parallel, I'm finding center again. Now use a center drill and drill a pilot hole and then another drill that's slightly undersized. And then finally I'll come back and ream to exact dimension. Back in the lathe, I'm taking a piece of stock and sanding it down to just a tiny bit with some thousand grit sandpaper. This makes a beautiful fit with the other piece. So much so, in a rare quiet moment in the shop, you can hear it's almost airtight even though it spins freely. Mm -hmm. 
Off camera, I've made a tailstock die holder. It features some of my prototype screws. I'm pointing this out because I think this is what is called foreshadowing. With the lathe running at slow speed, I'm moving the tailstock in, and I'm using just a little bit of pressure to get the die to bite and start threading. After that, I'm still feeding the tailstock, but with only enough pressure to keep up with the die as it feeds. At the desired depth, I flip the lathe into reverse and feed the tailstock in the opposite direction until it's clear. This method takes a little bit of practice, and there will probably be tears a couple of times when you have to remove tiny broken pieces of steel from a small die. Once you get it down, it's totally worth it. Then I'm going to turn the lead screw head down a bit, but not close to final size. You'll see why later. All that's left for this step is to part off. I'm taking another piece of scrap cut off aluminum and facing it on the ends. I'm using some spray adhesive to put fine emery cloth on one side and thousand grit sandpaper on the other and then back in the chuck it goes. I can then take the little tool post mounted tool we made earlier, remember that? And get it nice and perfectly aligned with the makeshift disc sander. I probably should have mentioned I don't have a disc sander. That's why I did this. If you or someone you love has a disc or belt sander, I'd probably use that. Now I can use my screw on a stick to run the cross slide back and forth while it's turning to get a nicely, really squarely sanded screw head. First with the emery cloth, and then with the fine sandpaper. Because the screw has such a long part that's not threaded, I had previously turned down a little spacer piece out of scrap. You can see it here with the little step in it. It serves to support the screw, but also the smaller part of the step is the desired head size of the screw. Once I have the screw head to size, I'm using a flat piece of steel with sprayed on emery adhesive on one side and thousand grit sandpaper on the other. The little step on the spacer gives me enough room that I can really keep the sanding square to the sides and I don't run the risk of rounding over the corners. Once the screw head is sanded down, I'm going to deploy the Dremel to do some final polishing. The lathe is running backwards, so it's going the opposite direction of the Dremel tip. I have some diamond paste. I'm going to go through a couple of different grits, 5 micron, 2.5, and, and finally quarter. I buy these felt polishing tips off eBay in bulk, and I pair the tip with each grit so I don't cross-contaminate. Okay, it's time to cut the slot. I put the screw on a stick into a collet in a collet block, and then mount it in a vise on the mill. I carefully measure the correct height and then start to cut and then disaster. Somehow the stub arbor wasn't completely tight and the blade had a little bit of wiggle in it, which led to a poor quality cut and angling down. The screw, which had been the cherished workpiece, is now scrapped. Because I need to finish this video, don't you despair. I grabbed one of the other screws from the die holder I mentioned earlier and we'll bring this home. Polishing the top is very similar to doing the sides. With screw on a stick still in the collet chuck, I can hold it steady and polish the screw head. We're aiming here for something clock and watchmakers call black polish. That is to say the polish is so high and flat that you can see the reflection of a light source well, but when it's turned away it suddenly is nearly black. And after a few passes with the diamond polish, I think we're there. Not absolutely perfect, but for something which can be done in a few minutes, I'm very pleased. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.